The Witcher is a book series turned Netflix show starring Henry Cavill in a world filled with magic users and monsters. Many of the series' creatures aren't just pulled from thin air, they're deeply rooted in mythology and folklore. Here's the real mythology behind The Witcher. The Witcher's Kikimura shows up straight away, a terrifying swamp monster that looks like it's part spider, part crayfish, and all angry. While the Kikimura is a very real mythological creature that shows up in Russian folklore, the more traditional version of it looks quite different. According to the New York Public Library, a Kikimura looks more like a tiny, but grotesquely shaped, woman than the crab monsters of Netflix's show. They traditionally haunted homes, but they could also be found living in lakes and ponds in the wilderness. Mostly, though, they preferred houses. And if residents started hearing strange sounds, the sort of sound that could make blood run cold and anxiety go through the roof, there was a good chance a Kikimura had taken up residence. A home was more likely to attract a Kikimura if a child had died or been buried there and they were frequently linked to the misfortunes of a mother. They were more mischievous than evil, known for leaving wet footprints across floors, tormenting animals, and interfering with the spinning of yarn. It's not all bad news. They were typically married to a domovoy, a more benevolent male creature that resembled a tiny imp, was born old and aged backwards, and protected his house from evil. The Witcher, Geralt, is known by many names, including the unflattering Butcher of Blaviken. He gets that particular moniker after being approached by both the mage Stregobor and the estranged Princess Rinfrey, each one wanting him to kill the other. Geralt, neutral in the affairs between humans, refuses, and, well, he ended up with a new nickname. The intriguing thing about this portion of the story is that Rinfrey was supposedly cursed. She'd been born during an eclipse known as the Black Sun, and according to a prophecy, girls born at that time would ultimately bring about the end of civilization. And that's not something author Andrei Zepkovsky made up. I studied the girls born around the Black Sun, and I found horrendous internal mutations among them. Eclipses have traditionally been signs of ill omens. That's not surprising. Ancient cultures were reliant on the sun and the moon for survival, and when something unusual happened, it was a terrifying deviation from the norm. There are stories of civilizations ending and warring people making peace, both because they thought the eclipse heralded the end of the world, and there were plenty of warning signs given to pregnant women, too. Dr. Sujata Mittal told Romper that traditional Indian beliefs say the negative energy given off by an eclipse has a negative impact on an unborn baby. And according to the Farmer's Almanac, it was widely believed that an eclipse would place a curse on an unborn child. When Geralt realizes the monster he was hired to kill isn't as monstrous as he first thought, he refuses to fulfill the contract on Torque the Sylvan. It was touch and go for them at first, with his horns and his goat's legs, but then he starts to speak. I am Torque the Sylvan, a rare and intelligent creature! The idea of spirits with distinctly goat-like features is a major motif throughout Greek mythology. The Pans were a group of creatures that looked just about exactly as Torque does. They were sometimes the sons of the nature god Pan, sometimes of Hermes or Zeus, but they were always pastoral spirits who looked over the herds and tended to get really, really frisky. They're similar to the Satyrs, who had the features of a donkey rather than a goat, and there's a lesser-known Slavic version of the idea, too. He's known as the Old Man of the Forest. And while he watches over the animals and is, for the most part, indifferent to people, he does have something of a trickster streak that makes him a danger to travelers. He typically lives alone or with his family of adopted foundlings, and he's often depicted as more human than Torque. He does, however, have horns and hooves in some stories, and in case you run into him, the best course of action is to try to make him laugh. There's a huge plot point that's been confusing a lot of people in the Witcher lore, called the Law of Surprise. It's basically a bargain. If someone's life is saved, they offer their savior a reward, without knowing what that reward is. Law of Surprise has been called. You kill them? Kill me. Still confused? It's inspired by a tradition in Slavic folklore called the Rite of the Unexpected. It dates back to stories in at least the 9th century, and it's a common way to explain the transfer of control of people in particular. There's another commonly retold version, too, where someone is promised the first thing that greets a traveler when he returns home, or the first person to speak to him. Here's how the stories usually go, in a simplified form. A man saves the life of another man, say, a merchant. The man accepts the right of the unexpected as payment, and the merchant returns to his home. There, he finds his wife is pregnant. The unborn child is the unexpected, or the surprise, and ends up in the care of the man as a ward, or eventually wife. The Witcher gives the idea a few extra layers than that, but knowing that it's a very old concept in our world helps to explain why it's taken so seriously in Geralt's world. 
Geralt's toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Striga is one of the Witcher's epic fights, and the creature involved is one that dates back to Roman mythology. There's a few different versions of this one, according to the Encyclopedia of Vampire Mythology. The Striga, Strigan, or Strega, was a cross between a vampire and a witch, often said to be the spirit of a witch returned from the dead. She could turn into an owl and fed on the blood of children. Those that didn't die immediately often wasted away. Honey cakes, chicken hearts, and sadly, puppies were often given as offerings to keep her away from human children. Similar tales were told in Macedonia and Romania. In the later tales, she was called a Strigoyu, and just speaking her name was enough to summon her. She would typically settle into an abandoned house, taking the form of a red-headed woman who could only be vanquished by nailing her to the bottom of her coffin. Strangely, there is also a Strigoi Morti. This creature is male, often the seventh son of a seventh son, and while he's just as terrifying as his female counterparts, he's thought to be a friend of the Roma clans. When Geralt takes on the Striga, he's not just taking on some random monster. This one has a backstory. She's actually a princess, and things get complicated when it's revealed that her mother was hooking up with the king. Ordinarily, that's not a problem, but King Foltest and Ada were brother and sister. Icky? Absolutely. But it's also ridiculously common in mythology and folklore. Take Zeus and Hera, rulers of the pantheon of Greek gods. They were brother and sister. Zeus hooked up with his sister Demeter, too, and they had Persephone, who later had two children with her father. Persephone is the figure at the heart of one of Greek mythology's most well-known love stories, the myth that explains the seasons. After Hades falls in love with her and spirits her away to the underworld for a few months out of the year, that's when winter happens. Oh, and Hades? That's her uncle. And it's not just the Greeks either. King Arthur, the most chivalrous of them all, had a son, Mordred, whose mother was Arthur's half-sister, Morgase. Most versions of the tale say they weren't aware of their relationship before Arthur tricked her into sleeping with him by pretending to be her husband, and somehow that just got even worse. The Doppler shows up in episode 5, and he's essentially a creature that can take the form of anyone else. The Witcher's lore allows for some stipulations. They have to have met the person and be of a similar size. We'd planned on wearing this one for a while. The name is a hint as to the inspiration, the doppelganger. While the term was only coined in the 18th century, the idea of having a double goes back to ancient Egypt. There we have the Ka, where the soul takes a form that was seen as a spiritual version of the physical body. Other cultures believed it was simply a harmless premonition, while English and Irish traditions described the creature as a fetch, an apparition that signaled the death of the original. Strangely, this is one monster that's had a basis in science. According to BBC Future, there have been instances of people who have seen their doppelgangers. One 21-year-old man described getting up one morning, then turning to see he was still laying in bed. Unable to reconcile what he was seeing, he threw himself out of a window in an attempt to realign realities. He survived, underwent surgery for a brain tumor, and the fandoms disappeared. The Witcher's Jinn shows up in the episode conveniently titled Bottled Appetites, and it's a creature that's familiar to almost everyone. Everyone who's ever seen Aladdin, at least. I'm looking for a gin. For a, for a gin? A gin? Like a genie? <laughs> the floaty fellas with the, the bad tempers and the banned magics, that kind of genie. That's the popular image of them, but the gin from mythology and folklore are less like Aladdin's genie more like the one from Neil Gaiman's American Gods. According to Vice, the first mentions of the jinn date back to the pre-Islamic Arabian world. They're neither good nor bad, they can take the form of humans and animals, and even though they're spirits, they're very physical spirits in that they can eat, sleep, and love, when they're in the human world at least. The original jinn could pass between the human realm and their own spirit realm freely. In the 7th century, they were worshipped as the masters of certain crafts and protectors of nature. Farmers were particularly fond of them, as it was said they had the ability to make the land fertile. Poets were likely to meet one, and those that were inspired by these otherworldly beings were called shayir. Later, jinn made the jump from folklore to mainstream religion. They're mentioned in the Quran. According to Live Science, it's now not uncommon for psychiatric patients to blame a jinn for things like hallucinations. The very first episode of The Witcher is a retelling of one of the original short stories in the series, and it's also a seriously dark retelling of the classic tale of Snow White. In Sapkowski's version, Renfri is Snow White, and as she mentions in the show, she killed the hunter sent to kill her, and continued down the path of death and destruction. I had to survive. I stole rather than starve. I killed rather than be killed. 
She's an assassin in the books and travels with a band of equally deadly dwarves. Today, most people are more familiar with the Disney version of Snow White, but the version chronicled by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm and finalized in 1857 was pretty different. That starts with the stepmother telling the hunter to bring back Snow White's liver and lungs. He brings back the organs of a boar, which she eats. The dwarves have no names, the poison apple is still there, and the prince? He buys the seemingly dead Snow White, and she's only revived when the servants drop her. There's also a reward comeuppance at the end, when the evil stepmother is given iron slippers heated to red hot to dance in until she collapsed and died. And that's the version the Grimm's dialed back a bit. In earlier versions, the prince slaps the poisoned apple out of Snow Wife's mouth when he hits her sleeping form, and it's her mother who demanded her death. Yikes. Whatever you call him. Don't call me human. Newcomers to the franchise might find themselves wondering what exactly Geralt of Rivia is if he's not human. The idea that witches and witch hunters are something other than human is one that's rooted in Slovenian myth. Some of the oldest sources written on witches and wizards describe them as demonic creatures rather than human ones, and sometimes they were actually a gift from God. Traditions and tales surrounding wizards have more elements of a shaman or a druid than a typical magic user we think of today. A Kresnik was something similar. These magical beings from old folklore are often more shamanic than the fire and ice magic users we think of today, and were said to fight witches and other demonic creatures. Sounds sort of familiar, doesn't it? Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite movies and TV shows are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.